All right. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Veterinary Life Coach Podcast. Today, I am blessed and honored to have a very special guest on the podcast. It's Dr. Susan Sales, and she is the owner of Brooklyn Road Veterinary Clinic in Jackson, Michigan, and she's been here with me once before. So I'm really excited to do this again. Welcome to the podcast, Sue. Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. I I love, love, love reading all of your notes weekly. I love to get the, the notes from you. And so I've been looking forward to doing this again. Awesome. I'm so excited. Well, on the last podcast that we did, you mentioned that it would be fun to talk about mistakes. And I thought that was an excellent idea. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about um, things that we've done in the past that we consider mistakes or errors that we've made, because we all know that none of us are perfect. And um, maybe anybody that's listening can learn some lessons from us and avoid some of these mistakes that we've made, right? Oh, I sure hope so. If nothing else, if they're making the same mistake, they can get a, oh yeah, I feel that. I understand that. <laughs> well, know that they're in good company, right? Yes. All right. So let's just kind of be free form here and just throw some ideas out. I know you came up with a list. I came up with a list and okay. um, we'll sure. just chat about it and see what comes of it. Okay. Sure. All right. Yeah. So do you want uh, to go first? Yeah. My biggest mistake, I think, and, and it's a hard one. It's not one that's easy to just say, oh, just don't do that, um, is being in fear. Um, I think that a lot of what we do in management, um, you have to be confident and you have to take risks. Um, and being afraid to take those risks can really set you back. It can really make your life harder than it has to be if you don't do the things that you need to do because you're afraid. Um, and so, you know, some of the, that's the underlying um, cause, but some of the things that I'm thinking about um, keeping an employee too long because oh. you're afraid you can't live without them. <laughs> I have probably done the that. number one. <laughs> yeah, I have definitely done that. Thinking I could change someone. Yeah. Yeah. I have some good stories about that. Do you want to get into the nitty gritty of the stories or sure. do you just want to sure. keep it yeah, on a high level? I think that's a, I think it's a big one for everybody. Oh, it's uh. so hard. Yeah. Because you, you think that either you're going to fix that person or, um, or you just can't live without them because it's a, a warm body. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or you even have yourself convinced that all your clients love this person. And if you let them go, they're going to leave you or they're going to be upset with you, or they're going to whatever. Um, you just, that fear holds you back. Yeah. Um, or, or the rest of your staff's going to be angry with you if you let someone go because they're going to have to pick up the work. And, and there's some truth to that. I mean, I, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, especially in this COVID environment. It's been, it's been brutal on a lot of people, but I think more people would be happier um, if the toxicity were out of their environment. I mean, you see a difference when you, when you finally do get to the point where you get the courage and you, you make the decision that needed to be made that most of the time you knew a long time ago it needed to be made. <laughs> you just couldn't do it for whatever reason. Um, when you finally do release that person, there's a totally different feel that comes over the rest of the team. Um, and it's, it's amazing how they, they don't mind doing some things because they're happier. Right. Well, because the, sometimes the employees in a place know long before the owner. Oh yeah. Because like it or not, if you're in charge of a practice, whether you're the owner or the manager, the team will know things. Sometimes they won't tell you purposefully because they're afraid because they don't want to rock the boat. And then sometimes they're afraid of retaliation from, you know, like I had a situation Whoever. where I had somebody that was in a power position and this person was kind of abusing my staff and I didn't know it. Like I was kind of the last one to know and people were leaving and this person told me it was because of me and I just believed it. Like I trusted this person so much. So, yeah. yeah so even in some instances you don't know yeah 
Yeah. yeah, it is. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you just have a little bit of a feeling that something's off and you just yeah. don't know where or you might not know who. Um, and, and that's a tough, a tough place to be in. But um, most of the time, by the time I, I got to the point where I knew who it was, um, I was ready to make. And now I have no problem making the decision. Um, I'm, I'm much stronger than I was when I started out in management. And so that, that was my encouragement to other people is if you really have made the decision and you know, it's time to let someone go, don't be afraid. Um, cause the good things that are going to come from it are so much better than, than the bad. Um, there'll be some bad, but I, I had a person also in a position of power and, um, it, it was actually an associate, um, doctor. And so that's a, person that, I mean, all of the staff I put tremendous trust in, but an associate doctor is someone that you, you rely on for a lot of things. Um, and it, it was someone that I, of course, you know, was friends with. And so that friendship and the, the uh, business part is hard to separate sometimes. Yeah. And, sometimes you know, that friendship will cloud your judgment. It will, it will. It, it, it makes you more forgiving of things, um, which can be good, but it can, can be a bad problem for the business if it's creating issues. Um, so yeah, and, and I, that, that was the next thing on my list too. It's funny that you mentioned that trying to fix people because either hanging on to the toxic person too long usually turns into trying to fix them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm giving really them every opportunity. That. Yeah. I always try to give people enough rope and let them make the decision, but sometimes that bites you in the butt, you know, like you, yeah. you hold on too long yeah. and allow them too much grace. And I've done that more times than I can count. Because yeah. I'm, I'm one of those people that I want to think the best of everyone. Mm -hmm. And because I'm that way, I'm very trusting. Like I've, I've had employees that I trusted and my husband will be like, you know, you keep giving them slack. You keep cutting them slack. And like, he'll know before I know that I'm doing that. And I'll be like, yeah, I think you're right. I think I'm letting this person um, just my... I don't know what you would call it, but my, um, I'm very open-minded and very trusting. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. sometimes that, uh, that allows people to take advantage of me. Yeah. And I think that's not the best quality for a leader to have. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a hard place because you want to, you want to have some grace. You want to give grace to people that you work with and you want to think the best of them. And I think that's a good quality to have is thinking the best of, of them instead yeah. of assuming the worst. Um, but it, it really is painful for the rest of the staff when you're hanging on to that person um, who is just toxic and, and abusive. Um, and they're smart. They do it when you're not there. Yes, they're, they're absolutely. not. They're not going to do it in <laughs> front of your face. They're very or charming. You. Yeah, they're very charming when you're around. I always, I always say that to my team. I'm like, look, you see a lot of things that I don't see because everyone's on their best behavior when the leader right. is around. Like a lot of the staff that I have now have known me for years, and so I kind of know them, warts and all. But when you have somebody that's playing that toxic game. They're very good at manipulating the situation so you don't see it. And mm -hmm. the team comes to you and says, this person is awful and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the things I would encourage people to do is trust. When you start hearing a lot of the same thing coming from different people, then, you know, it's, they're not always just ganging up on someone. Like I want to think, oh, they're just ganging up. No, right. sometimes they know more than you because they see it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you have to trust your judgment with your staff overall. I mean, if you have a great overall staff and they're coming to you and talking to you about someone that is a problem, it, you did a good job in getting a good staff there. They're trying to help you. You need to let them help you. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I think sometimes we don't. We think either we think we know best or we just, we let people pull the wool over our eyes. Mm. You know, we allow it. Maybe because we yeah, don't. I just remember. It, 
Yeah, yeah. I remember thinking again from that fear perspective, if if this person leaves, I'm I don't know if I can make it. I, I how I can't pick up the slack. I can't do the work. It's better to have somebody who who can do at least some of it, even if I don't love everything about them, you're not gonna love everything about them. And I kept finding ways to convince myself that it was okay um, to continue, you know, behaviors that, that were not okay. Yeah, yeah, I definitely went through that more than once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and well, I, would... I think that happens to a lot of people. Yeah. So how would you recommend, because we're kind of talking about that fear, that fear of mm -hmm. letting people go. Yep. How would you recommend that people get over that if, if that is a big problem for them? I mean, I kind of know what I would coach somebody to do, but what do you think? Um, yikes. It's a, it's a hard, I think some of it comes from experience. I don't think that anyone is just ultimately going to go right out there and not have the fear because it, it comes from learning. You, you have to make mistakes. And so you have to give yourself some grace there too. If you've made some mistakes to say, okay, this is what I learned from that. And, and I'm going to watch for these behaviors, um, or I'm going to, um, have some trusted people, um, within my environment, whether it be at work or at home or, or some of both. Um, like you said, having, having, uh, your husband to talk to and bounce things off from sometimes having an objective third party can, can help you to see things that you're not willing to see, or that you're trying not to see. Yeah. Um, but having the practice maybe. Yeah. yeah. And then having that open communication inside the practice, with the rest of your team. If you're hearing problems, hey, let's sit down and, and let's you know work through this. Um, what makes you say that she's mean or what makes you say that she's toxic? What let's give some specific examples and let's you know sort through this. And then um, you know, really sitting down yourself and even if it takes making a list of pros and cons so that you can feel more comfortable with your decision, um, really uh, looking at it and not just going based on emotion or feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, on, I think when you say that, like I was, I was thinking that it's a good idea to trust your gut, but also understanding that sometimes your gut is skewed because of the fact that you create friendships, like in any small business, I know this has probably happened to you because you're super friendly. And so am I. And I think on some level, you start to become friends with these people that you're working with. And so that will cloud your judgment a little bit because, because I'm all for trusting my gut, but sometimes yeah. in these situations, your gut isn't right. It doesn't tell you what's going on until it's, not, I wouldn't say too late. It's never too late to make this kind of a decision, but sometimes you've let it go on a long, long time before your gut finally wakes up and says, oh, this person's bad. <laughs> I need to get them I, out of here. Exactly. If you find, so here's kind of a litmus test. If you find yourself coming home and complaining to your spouse about the same person over and over doing the same things over and over, there's something there. You need to listen and pay attention and you may not recognize it, but they can be, again, your sounding board and say, Hmm, I wonder if this has happened before. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you um, remember that other person that you yeah. went through this before a year ago? Oh yeah. This is the same kind of person. This, this is the same thing happening again. Um, and, and, uh, if that person were not in your practice tomorrow, how would you feel? And if you say to yourself, oh, that would be such a relief, then you've already made the decision. You're just not willing to, to make the call and, and go through on the action of letting them go, I think. Right, because you don't want the confrontation, right? Because you don't right. know how they're going to react. Because I've, right. I've fired people and they've been perfectly fine and calm. And then I fired other people and they just explode. Oh, so yeah. I, I think you have that fear of the explosion. Like what's going to happen? And are they going to retaliate? Or are they going to, yeah. you know, trash me on, on social media? And the other thing I was thinking when you were just saying what you were saying is 
if you're more afraid of losing a friend than taking care of your business, I think yeah. that's a problem because that happened to me, yeah. you know, in the, in the one instance yeah. where it got really ugly, it was because I thought this person was a really close friend of mine and I was afraid to lose her as a friend instead yeah. of protecting my business. And, yeah. um, and that's kind of something that I don't know if we want to move a little bit away from this, but something that I had on my list is be careful about who you trust yeah. in your business, because sometimes you get so invested in a person in a trusting relationship that you let them take too much trust. And yeah. I, it didn't happen to me where I got actual um, money lost from my business, but I have two really good friends that own practices that had someone that they trusted implicitly for years steal gobs of money from them because yeah. they trusted too much. And so it, it kind of felt like my relationship with this person that I'm talking about that I just, I was so invested in the friendship. I had a hard time being objective. Yeah, I, don't know if I completely that. agree. Yeah, I luckily, knock on wood as well, have not had the issue with embezzlement or, or um, any of the, the theft um, that I know some places have had, but you do, you place a lot of trust on the people that you work with. And I think um, there you have to remember to also have checks and balances in place um, and good business practices as, as a basis for some of what you do. Um, we um, just in the last couple of years um, put some cameras um, in the clinic and it's not because I have a problem or there's a person that I don't trust. It's because it protects us. Right. It protects us from, from the public. If someone were to come in and have an issue, then we've got that documented. Um, and, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, um, you would think the employees wouldn't have an issue with it, but it was right. a difficult thing yeah. because it, it made them feel that they weren't trusted. Right. Um, yeah. So there's, there's kind of, <laughs> it's a kind fine line, right? It's a yeah. fine line between, cause I, I really do. I'm very trusting. But years ago, and this is, this is a piece of advice that I got, and I think it's a really good one. So I pass it on to as many people as I can. Years ago, when I first started um, owning my practice, I went to some CE and I, I wish I remembered the gentleman's name because I, I would share it if I knew. Um, but he was giving a lecture on um, kind of practice management type things. And I distinctly remember him saying, and I've always followed this advice, never let anyone have access to your checking account. And at that time it was, don't let anyone sign your checks, but mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't use paper checks anymore, but it was, don't let them have access to that bank account, that checking account. Um, and don't ever let anyone open your mail. And I thought that was a very odd piece of advice, but the reason that he said that was because so many people embezzle by like charging things on a credit card or ordering something from the drug company and then just kind of taking it out in that mail. Yeah. And now it would be email more or less, right? But right. that mail is your track. So if a credit card statement comes in and you don't match that credit card statement up and make sure you actually bought the things you bought, then that's how people embezzle. Yeah. And so I I took that advice to heart and I, I was the only person ever to sign checks on my checking account other than my payroll service, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then um, I always paid my own bills. Like I always opened the mail and I always paid the bills because then I had a handle on what money was going out of the practice as well as what was coming in. Like I always had somebody, I kind of did the books, but then I had a bookkeeper, but I kind of watched all that stuff. And I really think that had I not, that it would have been much easier for people to steal from me. And I know that the two people that I'm talking about that I know personally that were badly embezzled, these were employees that they trusted like with their life. They had known them for like 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. And these people were stealing them blind and they just didn't know it because they weren't, they weren't um, checking. You know, so not having good checks and balances, I think is a, is a big mistake. 
that you need to try to avoid is not being a little bit like, don't trust all the way (laughs) in any situation, right? You have to have a little bit of skepticism. Yeah. I think as a business owner, you do. You do. And again, that you set, you have to separate your friendship, you know, as a friend, would I call on you? Do I trust you? Absolutely. In my business, I have to protect my business as the bottom line. Right. And if you're my friend, then you'll understand that I am protecting my business and I'm not judging you. I'm, I'm just protecting my business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I do the same thing. I still at this point am in charge of ultimately of my checkbook. Um, yeah, it's... the only other signer I had on mine, because you always have to have like a separate uh, somebody on it. And it yeah. was my dad because he was my bookkeeper and I knew he wouldn't steal from me. So it was right. like me and him and my manager didn't, didn't have access to that. Yeah. Like they did, my manager does a lot, but nope, you can't sign a check. And it is a little bit inconvenient at times, you know, if you're out of town or, you know, back in the old days when you had to have paper checks, now you can do mm-hmm. credit cards and, you know, I'm not against giving um, someone a credit card in your business, as long as you're the one that's checking those statements. Right. And making right. sure that they're not buying stuff that they shouldn't be buying. Cause people will do that too. They'll order from your Amazon account and have it shipped to their house. Right. Don't think they won't. Right. I've I've seen people do it. Yeah. And, you know, I I, want to say nobody starts out big. They're not going to spend thousands of dollars in the beginning. They're going to say, I'm really short this month. I know Julie wouldn't mind if I could just order this thing that my kid needs for school and I'll pay her back. And they do it and nobody catches it and suddenly it's like huh well now I really need this and it and it snowballs on itself right right can you hear that somebody started some machine outside my- oh no I can't hear it oh I think it's a lawnmower hold on <laughs> please hold I'm just gonna shut the window so it won't be so loud. all right they're coming to mow my lawn perfect timing <laughs> they didn't know I didn't get the word out that I was having a podcast tonight with you they didn't care <laughs> yeah well, it's not quite as loud it's still loud but I guess we'll just have to I can't hear them at all so okay good 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 deal yeah since I shut the window it's better yeah so so anything else about that I like that whole advice of not being afraid to fire people mm-hmm. you know kind of trusting your gut I would say it it kind of dovetails into the um, not trusting everyone um, to be kind of devil's advocate. You need to delegate, not delegating things is the worst for you. Oh my gosh. It's so overwhelming. And And that control freak thing, right? It's yeah. And it's toxic. Really. It is. You, You have to trust enough to delegate but then you have to have those double checks in place. Yeah. So have you made that mistake where you like overburdened yourself with too much? I have. I start, when I started out, um, I I had my hand on everything. And I think that's kind of important in the beginning that you do have your hand on everything because you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing and and where things are at. Um, But you need to, as you progress, be able to let go of things. Um, and, um, there's nothing wrong with saying, I really like to do this aspect of business and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to give away the stuff that I don't like very much. I'm going to delegate that to someone who can do it better than me because they enjoy it. Right. Um, so yeah, human resources, that aspect of business ownership is really difficult. The whole hiring and firing and management of people is not something that everyone can do. Um, but if you can find the right person and you can help and, and delegate that, it can make your life as a doctor a lot better. <laughs> yeah. When I first started working at my practice, um, it was uh, two men that owned it. And um, I was really interested in management. I wanted to have my own practice. Like I was super driven in that direction. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating was one of the doctors who was brilliant. He was a brilliant um, veterinarian. 
and he was one of the owners, but he would do things as simple as um, making up postcards for vaccine reminders. And he would sit at the computer and he would print them and he would tear them open. Like he'd have somebody help him, but he Mm -hmm. would do all of it himself. And I was like fascinated by that. And so after I was there for a little while, I said, why are you doing that? Like anybody could do that. You could train a monkey to do that. Right. (laughs) And he was just like, he didn't, he didn't realize that he was, and he would get really stressed out. Like he would blow his wig sometimes because he was so stressed because he was full-time veterinarian and managing everything and dealing with all the human resources stuff. And that was before we had a manager. And then he was printing postcards. And I was like, wait a minute, that's something super like you could give that up easily. And so I had a talk with him. I was like, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I don't know. I never thought about it. (laughs) And I said, don't you think someone else can do that? Like, are you afraid it's going to get done wrong? Like, what is the reasoning? And he really didn't have a good reason. I think he just didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, why don't you train me to do that? And I'll learn how to do it. Now I'm still a veterinarian, right? I shouldn't be doing that. But I thought if he could hand it off to me and I could learn how to do it, then I could hand it off to someone else. And that's what I did. I learned it. I did it for a couple months and then I got one of the other employees to do it. Um, But I, I just think that's a fascinating example of how sometimes we just don't think about what we can delegate and, you know, what horrible mistakes could be made by the postcards. You know, that's a super easy thing. (laughs) We get sucked into this tornado of this is what I do and I have to get all of my things done and I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow or the same thing this month that I did last month. And you, you got to step break through and step out of that and look at it from the outside and go, okay, if I want things to be different, what do I have to do differently? Cause it's not going to just happen, mm-hmm. but it's very easy, especially when you're overwhelmed to just keep doing what you've always been doing because you ju- it has to get done. Right. It, Somebody's it has to get done. It, right. Yeah. If I don't do it, no one else will. I think, th- I think that kind of thinking is, well, I have to do it because that's the only way it'll get done. You know, I, I had that thinking with my inventory a lot, you know, until I got a good inventory manager, it was like, well, I've got to, I've got to make sure this stuff is, is right. And I got to count it and I got to, you know, stay after work and do it. And, Um, you know, yeah, you have to check in, you have to spot check and make sure that person's doing their job, but you know, it's not something that you need to have a doctor doing or the owner doing, you know, I, I have this discussion with my manager. Sometimes I'm like, she'll tell me something she has to get done. I'm like, well, can't so-and-so do that? Like I got to order lunch for the meeting. I'm like, yeah. I would just go to the receptionist and say, hey, order lunch for the meeting, please. Or does anybody mm-hmm. interested in ordering lunch? Because people volunteer. Is anybody interested in making the schedule? Is anybody interested? And, you know, we do that all the time. And people are more than happy to help. They want to be feel part of the practice. And they I do. think we and forget that. Yeah, giving people the, the power um, is a tremendous, tremendous team building experience for them um if if they realize wow you trust them enough to to do this activity um it's a good thing for the team to to be able to hand things off so it's not just good for you it's good for the team too to to hand things out i i think you know one of the pitfalls is that um when we're talking about you know a doctor shouldn't be doing this or doesn't need to be doing that it can very easily come across to the rest of the team that you think you're too good. Right. That, right. And so um, you, you have to be a little careful in how you present it to people, but it depends on what kind of practice you have. But we've always had an open practice where we discuss um, the finances of things right. and explaining that, you know, a doctor is generating income when they're seeing patients. And so if sure they can do a lot of these other things they're a person um, they're they're intelligent they they can do it but if they do that it takes away from what it can bring to the rest of the team and 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 on down too i mean if a technician is um cleaning a kennel when you could have a kennel assistant or someone else doing that it's taking away from what they could be doing 
that's more productive for the team as a whole. Right. Um, and it's a, an efficiency that, that a lot of people struggle with, especially in the beginning of management careers, understanding um, there's, there's some efficiency there that you can have um, by having the right people doing the right jobs. Right. And, and being open to that trying, you know, mm -hmm. like you might give a job to somebody that just, they just can't handle it or they get right. too stressed out by it, you know, but if they want to try letting them try, and then if it isn't working out for them, you know, figuring out what's a better fit, because I, I'm a big fan of personalities and different personalities are better at different things and trying to get the job to fit the person because I've made that mistake where I've given yeah. a really detailed job to somebody that's not very detailed. Like I am yeah. not a super detailed. I don't like to sit there and do inventory. So for me to be the inventory manager probably isn't the best. Like as the owner, yes, I could pull out my detail. But if I was a technician or um, another employee in the practice and the doctor gave me the inventory job, I could do it, but it wouldn't be my best thing. I wouldn't do my best right. work because yeah. I don't, my personality doesn't fit that. Yeah, I'd be like, ah, it's a couple pills off, not that big of a deal. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how I operate. So, <laughs> and and I'm that detail. I'm that. I need a checkbox for everything kind of person yeah. and make my list kind of person. And so. The detail stuff is great for me, but that can mean I lose the big picture because again, I'm sucked into all of that detail that I'm, I can lose that I'm wasting time on things that aren't really making a difference. Yeah. So that could, that could be a mistake in and of itself is just not knowing yourself well. Yeah. Like I really think sometimes people don't know who they are. I've coached veterinarians in my practice that I ended up firing because I'm like, you don't understand your personality and how it affects others. And if you would just yeah. do a little self-work and understand the way your personality affects others, you would get so much further. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just don't want to, or they are too young, or, you know, they mm -hmm. haven't suffered enough pain yet with their personality to understand themselves. Um, but sometimes that mistake of just not knowing who you are and accepting yeah. your strengths and your weaknesses, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then giving that work to somebody that has your strengths, the things that you're not strong at. I yeah. Think can be a, a mistake that we make. Yeah. I, I actually had that down as one of my um, mistakes as well. Um, uh, becoming stagnant or not having, having personal growth and personal development. I think Per, the personal growth and personal development is really what drives you as a leader. Um, if you get stuck in the same, same old, same old, then um, people are going to get bored um, over time and you'll have a harder time maintaining your staff um, if you're not constantly trying to, to improve yourself so that you can understand them better. Yeah. Um, so that would mean like going to CE and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you think? I think going to CE, I think the other thing that helps you with personal development is cultivating a network of, uh, of friends and colleagues um, that you can reach out to and that you can ask questions of if you're struggling with things. I mean, that, that goes on down a little bit of a different path as well, but um, the personal development um, is, is huge um, for just making you a stronger person, um, helping you to alleviate your fears and to, to make those decisions and have those um, difficult conversations that you would maybe avoid before um, and, and really being able to truly connect with the people that you work with um, to be confident enough that you can be vulnerable with them um, and, and really move yourself forward and move the team forward through that. Yeah, um, I, I was fortunate in my career to have a, we have a group in the Detroit area um, of veterinary owners and leaders that would meet every month. And so we all were running different practices, different sizes, some were emergency, some were bigger, and basically just had a meeting every month and just chatted about different things. Like, how do you do this? And I have this problem. And, 
it was a very trusting group. We had very strong rules that when we talked about things, it would remain. We weren't competitive. Like we didn't try to take down somebody that was down the street. We were very supportive. And that was such a huge group. I learned so much from that group, from their mistakes. You know, I could talk to them about things that I was struggling Mm -hmm. with and they'd be like, oh, and in my practice, we do this. Or, you know, we just go around the room and brainstorm. And that was something that I think is very unique. Um, I haven't heard Mm -hmm. of too many other veterinarians that have had that kind of group, but if you're in a a major metropolitan area and there's a lot of practices and you trust a few of the other owners or even the managers or however you want to do it. We had a management group too. Um, But if you could get together and just shoot the breeze, you know, we got Mm -hmm. to the point where we would share everything, you know, down to you know, earnings and prices, which kind of is a little bit, yeah, um, to be careful. Legal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we got pretty, you know, pretty raw and we had agreements that we wouldn't take each other's employees, you know, so we were very right. trusting and man, I, I don't think I would have been nearly as successful as I was with my practice if I didn't have that group. So that's something, you know, I, I think if you can develop something like that in your area, even if it's just one or two other vets and -hmm. they don't even have to be from your area, like you and I, we're not in the same area, but we've talked about different problems with our practices. You know, we've met at the the MVMA meetings and things. So I really do think that you can't be shy when it comes to being a leader, whether you're an owner or whether you're a manager, whether you're just an associate in a practice, you're still a leader. Yeah. And I think you have to talk to other leaders. I think it's, yeah, I, it's vital. You will be amazed the difference that it makes if you can bring yourself to do that. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of our profession um, are introverts and it's difficult for them to reach out and have that sure. conversation in a safe way. And so, you know, finding a group and maybe you're not the one that started if you're the introvert, but finding a group of people that you feel safe with um, and can have those conversations with is huge, huge, huge in helping you in your practice. Um, yeah. I, I'm a member of a national group right now that we do much of the same that you were you were talking about. And um, you know, if if I have a question about um, uh, an employee fell and did this, and what are my rules, or how should I handle that, I can post it. And someone else who has more employees than me can say, well, I've been through this lots of times and we did this or we did that or throughout COVID, it was a huge benefit for all of us to share policies and protocols and, you know, what happens if this happens? Well, I had someone who was positive and, and it shared, we shared all of those things. And so I think, um, the mistake would be insulating yourself from other veterinarians, um, too much. I think, um, if you reach out and you build some network of, of connections, and they don't have to be your best friends. You don't have to you know, call them on Saturday night. It could be someone you talk with a couple times a year, but that when you see them, you know you can reach out to them if you need something. Right. And if something happens, you can call them up. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really important. I think, I think a big mistake would be trying to do it all on your own and thinking that yeah. you have to. Yeah, you know, I thought when I when I bought my practice, I thought, oh, I got to figure all this out, and that's far from the truth. Like I, it's, there were so many people that helped me, you know, including my dad, who was an accountant. He did all my bookkeeping, and like yeah. bookkeeping sucked. I learned how to do it, <laughs> but because I hate detail, it was terrible. And my dad would sit there for hours and find every penny, and I was just like, there's no way I could have done that. So just kind of being okay with having help and not, yeah, I mean, you get the benefit personal. of ideas from so many other people. If you can reach out there, you, you you can't think of everything on your own. It is not possible for you to think of everything on your own and, and to just get ideas from other people that make springboard a new idea for you of what right. could work for you. It doesn't even mean that they're giving you advice. They're just telling you, oh, we did this because of, and then it can spark an, a new thought for you of how that could be adapted to, to suit your situation. Whereas 
you might not ever have thought of that on your own. Oh yeah. So many times I got ideas just from listening to other people talk. Yeah. You don't even have to chime in. You can just sit there and listen. When I was at my yeah. meetings, it was like other people were talking about their situations and I was like, Ooh, I never thought of that. And I would yeah. just kind of scribble down notes and then try it in my practice. Kind of, kind of in line with that whole thing would be being open to your staff or your team being open to their ideas, because I think yeah. a mistake that I've seen other people make, and I've talked to people um, that are making this mistake, is thinking that when they are the veterinarian or whether they're the leader, that they have to do, they have to come up with all the ideas and it's all on them, you know? And I, I think knowing yourself well enough and being humble enough to, to open yourself to other people's ideas is so important. Yeah. And it can be difficult as a leader to be humble and to accept help from other people when you feel like you've got to be the superstar, the rock star, the hero. Um, you know, some people's personality is that they're the rescuer and they need to be the rescuer. And I think a, a good suggestion for that is when people come to you with ideas, um, I was I was classic. Um, I'd already thought of it most of the time. Um, I, that's just how my brain works. I'm constantly thinking about things. It's my business. It's my baby. Right. And I'd already ran five scenarios of why it wouldn't work. And so someone would come to me with something and I'd go, yeah, but, and spill all these things out. The best thing I ever learned to do was to stop and to listen before they you know, could, could be interrupted, listen to their whole interaction or whatever their idea was and say, let me think about that. And then really thinking about it. Um, because while yes, maybe I had thought about it on some level, what they were bringing forth might have had just a little caveat that would, would shift the outcome. Um, and it allows you time also to get over yourself, uh, get over that. I think I you know it all. Be the, I know everything. I've been know. here 20 years. I know how this you place know. runs. Yeah. I, I, I've lot. already thought of that. I've already thought of that. Get over <laughs> we yourself. We did that 10 years. We tried bit. that already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to do that and it didn't work because blah, 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 blah. Right. Okay. Well, we're, we are a different we now. Right. It's a different team. Yeah. And let's stop and think about it and really, you know, listen, if they're coming up with it, there's a reason that it's coming from somewhere. And then you can weigh the differences and maybe, yeah, you're right. It, it's not going to work because of whatever, but to immediately dismiss it without even listening and really thinking of it. Um, was a mistake that, that I used to make. Um, I can't say that I never make it anymore, but that, that I have gotten better at over time. Yeah. And I think too, if you allow the team to have their ideas and own their ideas, even if in the back of your mind, you know, that this is probably not going to work, just allowing it to play out and say, okay, well, let's try it for a month and see what happens. And even if you, you know, at the end of the month, you kind of think to yourself, well, yeah, I didn't think this would work. Sometimes you'll be surprised and it will work. Okay. It didn't work before, but now it's working because you have a different group of people and you give them, you give them the dignity of their ideas to let yeah. them play them out. And, you know, if it's not something that's going to hurt anybody, it's not going to hurt you to try it for a month. You know, yeah. it's that humility, I think, of not always thinking, you know, best. Yeah. And I, I think that that's something that, you know, sometimes young leaders and even, even now, the old leaders like me, I think we know it all because we've done it for so long. Oh yeah, we've done that, been there, done that. And I really have to check that, that thought that I know better because I've been doing this longer. You know, I, I do yeah. it. I do it with my texts all the time. I'm like, what do you think? I I'm thinking I should do this. What do you think? You know, like a, a bandage yeah. situation or, you know, what do you, what do you think we should do with this dog that is fighting the heck out of us and trying to jump off the table and we're all get hurt in our backs. And what do you think the mm -hmm. next move should be, you know, and give them some input. I yeah. think it makes your team stronger. 
Oh, I think it absolutely does. And, and just in general, one of the notes that I had was, um, you know, getting interested in things, even things that you've done a million times, get interested in the why, why do I do it the way that I do it? Um, and asking other people how they would do it and asking questions instead of assuming answers. Curiosity. Um, this yeah. is something that I, I'm going to show you this because it's interesting that you just said that. I have these little cards that I hang around sometimes just to kind of coach me when I'm coaching because uh -huh. sometimes I, I bulldoze. It says, listen, be curious. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm like thinking about the next thing I I'm going to say yeah. because I'm an extrovert and I'm chatty rather than just like sitting back and being curious. So it's fascinating that you said that. Yeah. And that's a new thing to me. <laughs> I will say that's that part of my personal development right now really? is what would you really... do? What would you not do instead? Just like get your own ideas and plow forward. Like, why wouldn't you listen? Mine is because I'm so chatty, as you can see. I usually had my own ideas and, and I also am very chatty and very outspoken. Um, and I wouldn't take a breath and stop and listen to other people. I would just keep going um, and not because let them probably, in. Part of yours is probably because you've already thought it out so much. Mm -hmm. Like you've already, because you're so detailed, you've already thought of all the details. And so you're just like, well, I already thought of that. So why do I have to listen? Yeah. Right. And that goes back to being aware of your personality yeah. and what you have a tendency to do. And then coaching yourself to be like, look, you have a tendency not to listen. So here's your reminder to listen. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah. And, that's and funny. we do it for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny though. But, but really, I mean, I think um, a lot of times we'll make judgments without knowing all of the, the interesting and pertinent information, um, not just as business owners, but as veterinarians or, or our team members as well. And so I'm trying to coach them to be curious about things. And instead of making a, a judgment or a decision about something to, to be curious and to ask. Yeah. Um, Don't you think that works with clients as well? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, the thing that came to my head immediately was um, I had a, a technician who was going through a, a chart with me and said, and um, they don't want heartworm prevention. And I said, well, why don't they want it? Well, I don't know. They just told me they didn't want it. I said, well, how can we help them to make an informed decision if we don't know what their why is? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and so you go in the room and you say, what is it about um, the heartworm prevention that, that you're averse to? Do you, you know, it can be cost. It can be the drug itself. It can be my dog doesn't like to take pills. And that's the last thing I want to do is consider, you know, a pill every month. It could be a lot of reasons. Um, and there's answers for most all of them. But if you go in the room and start spewing all this stuff that has nothing to do with their why you're not getting to the root of the problem it's that curiosity that really solves the issue um, well and sometimes just being curious about their perception of the pet's problem helps you get mm -hmm. a better history like I'll yes. be like, well, tell me about that what's what's that what does that mean when they say oh he's I don't know shaking well what does that mean what do you mean shaking mm -hmm. Like explain it to me, because I think there's so many times when the client makes the diagnosis for me yes. and I like, I wouldn't have gotten there if I didn't listen or if I didn't ask the right questions. Right. Yeah. And or, or conversely, they make the diagnosis and it's not the right one. And so you've got to tease out through your questioning what really is happening. Right. Um, yeah. Because they already so are at their conclusion. Yeah. 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 And I see that because I do some behavior consulting. So I see that a lot. Um, you know, we all hear the, he's so mean because he must've been beaten before I got him or, you know, <laughs> <I've> been abused. <laughs> yes. 
I'm like, well, okay, well, let's step that back and talk about why, why, what is he exactly doing that you think he's mean? And yeah. when does he do these mean things? And what is a typical day like for him? And I need to understand, you know, what's happening here. And, and it's the same with our staff and, and, and with our clients. If we understand what's happening and what's going on, we can make better decisions. So, yeah, I, I like that being curious. That's a really, mm -hmm. that's a good title for another blog. I might have to do that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. All right, let's see. I have a list here too. Let me see if there's okay. anything that we haven't touched on yet. Oh, I wrote one down, um, a mistake. And this, this kind of goes back to some of the stuff we've already talked about, but I, um, I wrote down my mistake is trying to change people that don't want to be changed. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of already talked about that is there are some people that don't want to know what kind of personality they have. They don't want to know why they're right. not a good leader. Like they don't want me telling them what's wrong with them, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. um, and then pushing to that agenda. You know, I I've told that story before on the podcast that I got fired from my first job and it was because I was trying to change the owner of the practice that I was working. Like I didn't like the way he practiced and I thought he was doing it wrong and I wanted to set him straight. And I tried really hard and I ended up getting myself fired. So, um, just understanding that yes, some people do need to change, but it's not always your job to change them, you know, yeah. obviously firing them, you know, if you can change them or you can change them when you're the boss, you can change them out the door, but, um, but just not always trying to get people to be the person that you want them to be. Like some people just don't want to change. Yeah. And then if they're, it, if they're toxic to your practice, like we talked before, then you got to let them go. My, my mistake kind of dovetails into that. And that is um, not hiring for culture, but hiring for skills. You can hire the person who could set a catheter in 10 seconds and can, um, you know, do these phenomenal technical things. But if they're not pleasant to be around and they don't fit your beliefs, you're going to be in for trouble. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so then you try and change them um, or you think you can, can convert them. And very few times does that happen where right. they, they really want to change. They, yeah. they, most people are not comfortable with change and they don't come in the door thinking, boy, when I get in there, I can't wait to see how she wants me to change. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> That's not, not where they're coming from. Yeah. So, um, well, and I, yeah. I think, I think another side of that same coin, if there, if that can be a thing is that some people, some people go into a situation that they think should be changed. Like I did and try to change it. And I just like kept trying and trying and trying mm -hmm. and the mistake in that situation was not just leaving when I realized that this wasn't going to change. The other mistake I think you can make is not even trying. Like I, yeah. I coach veterinarians when I'm coaching them and they're like, well, this place is toxic or this place is, you know, as soon as they get in there, they're like, oh, this, this doctor's going to be this way or that way. Rather than being like, okay, what can I do to try to turn this toxicity around? Is there anything I can do? And can I talk to somebody and see if they're open to change? You know, because right. sometimes they're afraid to make the suggestion, you know, in my, in my situation, it got me fired, but I've had many employees that came to me and said, you know, if they say it in the, a nice way, look, I really don't think we do this well. I think we could do it better. Here's what I'd like to try. I've had a lot of associates come in and want to change my anesthetic protocols over the years. Mm -hmm. And if they give me a good reason, you know, I went to the CE and this is what we did in school or whatever the reasoning is, if they give me a good reason, I'm perfectly open to change. So I think the other side is allowing your practice to change that you're in by mm -hmm. making suggestions. And you have to be a little careful. You know, you have to right. do it in a kind of way. You have to do it in a slow way. Sometimes if a place has been the same way for years, 
But I really do think that you can invest some time into that. I agree. And I think a good way to try and affect change is to, again, be curious about why things are the way they are. Um, instead of coming at your boss and saying, um, I don't like our anesthesia, I think we need to change our protocols, you could come in and say, can you tell me a little bit more about why we use drug XYZ? I noticed that we have a lot of bradycardia when we use that, and it makes me really uncomfortable. I think there could be some other choices, but I need to understand why we're using it. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's not threatening as a boss if someone came in. But if someone came in to me and was like, I don't, I, I want to, I want to start new protocols. Um, that's a little more. Yeah, and with in- no good reason, you know, like sometimes people just want to change to change. And right. to me, like, I love change. I'm, I'm all for it. But to have the right reason to, to take yeah. a whole hospital and change something that they're used to. I think needs good reason. So I think yeah. my point is just not being afraid of the discussion and, mm-hmm. and having the maturity to do it in a kind way. Yeah. And not just labeling a practice as toxic because they have whatever their culture is that sometimes people come into a practice and they can change the culture. Oh yeah. And I got to say, I am so frustrated by a lot of the the posts and things that you see on social media, people who have no knowledge of the situation, um, someone says, I, I'm struggling this, that, and the other, and everybody says, get out of there. It's toxic. Uh, that's the first knee-jerk reaction. Well, right. I, I get that, and there are a lot of toxic places. I am not discounting that at all, but I, I think, like you said, you you need to be willing to take some ownership and and seeing if you can make a change. And if you can't make a change, is it because of the way you approached it? And maybe you should try a different approach. Um, Or is this not the practice for you? And then again, not being afraid to say, this isn't the practice for me. I need to to move on. I need to go elsewhere. Right. Um, Yeah. And that can all be done in, in the kindest way. Oh like yeah. You don't have to stay at a practice that isn't doesn't match with your values like I did. Right. You don't have to do that and you don't have to fire somebody cuz you're mad. You know, it, it can just be an agreement that look, we just don't fit. Like there's something about us that doesn't fit or our practice doesn't fit you or vice versa. And or yeah, I'm I'm willing to try to change it. Let's try to change it and see if that works. You know, that there's so many ways to have a conversation and I think we've kind of lost that art. We've lost the art of sitting down across from a human and just being like, look, here's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling frustrated and overwhelmed. I'm feeling overworked. Is there something we can do? You know, rather than assuming that that manager or doctor or whatever just wants you to kill yourself, you know, and maybe there's some way to change things without calling it toxic or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Absolutely. I I think that the conversation thing is a really difficult problem for a lot of people. And that's uh, going back to the personal growth. There are ways that you can get help in your conversation skills. um, I love that. I tell people I love conflict. So if you ever want to learn how to have a conversation, it's not that I always do it right. I don't, but I've, I've had so many and I've made all the mistakes that you can make in those conversations that I really just think that, you know, it's a skill. Yeah. You can learn how to, how to have a conversation and come to an agreement at the end. And it, it gets easier. By no means do I feel hundred percent confident that, that I can affect every conversation that I have and nobody can, but I, it gets easier. I don't go into conversations with such trepidation that, oh, this is just going to go crazy and I'm not going to be able to handle it. You know, um, whatever the outcome is, we'll get through it. I, I, you know, there are things that you can do and, and there are some great, great resources out there. Um, for learning um, communication skills. And I think they're very underutilized. So um, 
if that's that's a, a mistake, um, it would be, again, not pushing yourself in, in some of the areas, learning what your weaknesses are and trying to work on them. Yeah, and remembering that as, as any person that's working in a practice, you have to take the time to get that training. Like, I think we think that we can't take a day off or we can't close our hospital because the clients yeah. are getting mad or whatever. Yeah. And I've always been a big believer in my practice of, look, continuing education and training, whether it's business training, whether it's medical training, whatever is so important. And you actually make more money if you take that time to go get that training. Yeah. So you'll spend money getting it. You might spend money losing money in your practice for a day or whatever, but it's so valuable in the long run that it will make you so much more successful. So I think the mistake of thinking that you can't take time off, whether it's time off for self-care or whether it's time off for training, I think is a huge mistake that we make in practice. Yeah, absolutely. And right along the same lines, thinking that there is a perfect time for anything. Uh, I'm going to put that off because it's not the right time. There is not a right time. Um, there's the time that you make because life is busy and, and there just isn't a perfect time. Sometimes are better than others. So yeah, there's some decision-making there, but to put off self-care um, because you don't have time for it, um, it's why our profession has a lot of the problems that it has right now. I, I think we are such givers um, and nurturers of animals and of everyone else, but not ourselves. Um, and so I'm working on that right now, even are on you? my own. That's, that's probably my, my uh, issue right now. Although, um, yeah, I, I actually um, worked even with a therapist a little bit about um, trying to find those things that bring me joy and not letting them go and and giving myself time and setting boundaries. And um, I think more people need to to not feel the stigma of getting help and taking care of themselves. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the, why I do what I do. I, I just saw that it was getting so bad. And um, I don't know, on some level, I've always been a really hard worker, but I've always had this idea that my life came before my work. And so I think that we really, we do need to continue to remember that. And it's a lesson from COVID, right? It was like, oh, 15 days, oh, two months. Oh, we're not going to do it. We're just going to work really, really hard because it's COVID. Well, now it's almost going on two years and we're still doing the same thing. It's like, no, we can't. Yeah. You know, something's got to give. And it's, it's sad Mm -hmm. that, that we have such a demand and we can't fill it, but we also, if we don't take care of the people that are taking care of the animals that we can take care of, then they're going to go by the wayside too. Right. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I wish I had done earlier as a business owner Um, I don't know that I'd call it a mistake, but I didn't even know it existed, or maybe they didn't exist in the same fashion as they do now, is to have an employee assistance program um, in your practice. Um, You know, it's a a easy, convenient way for them to reach out and to have help, um, uh, perhaps in a more anonymous function than going to their doctor and trying to get help. Um, and um, they're not very expensive. So as a practice owner, it's a great resource that you can provide to your team. Um, uh, Ours is through our local hospital, but lots of different resources are out there to have EAPs in your practice, and I would strongly encourage people um, to look at that. I didn't know what one was until, again, that national group that I'm a part of, everybody was saying, do you have an EAP? We just got an EAP. And I was like, "Uh, what what does that stand for? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And yeah, it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing for my team to have access um, to to someone um, that can help them. Yeah, using the resources that are available for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have any other mistakes? Oh my goodness. A lot. Yeah, we have covered a lot. I, I had the, the not hiring for culture boundaries and self-care. Um, this would be more under that kind of boundaries and self-care, but 
doing things that you're not passionate about. Life is too short to, um, again, and I, I'm looking at this from my own personal perspective. Um, I felt a need to give back to the community. And so when I was asked to serve on a, on a board um, for a local, local, actually municipality, I did it that's fine, but then some of these things you kind of get grandfathered into and they don't have a natural um, progression. And I decided, you know what, I'm not passionate about this. I, I did my, my community service and I'm glad that I did and I learned a ton. Boy, I talk about curiosity there, but, um, cause it was a zoning board. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really my... boring. Although there might be some good fights and you know, I love a good fight. <laughs> You know, that, that's not my area of like expertise that. by yeah. any means, but, um, but it was, it was interesting. It was, I found, found it interesting for, for a time, but I'm like, you know, I'm not passionate about this. And what I am passionate about is veterinary medicine. And so the things I want to do are things like this. I love, you know, the podcasts. I love being active um, in the MVMA and, and participating on committees and things that I can give little pieces of my time. It doesn't have to be, you know, hours and hours and hours, but here and there I can pick and choose and I can give what makes me happy. And that's part of the self-care um, for me is I enjoy giving of myself, yeah. but if it's something I'm passionate about, it doesn't feel like giving is it's, it's, right. it's self-care. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you I can win. A, I think that's a huge point is self-care doesn't have to mean meditation and sleeping in. Like there's so many things that you can do for self-care if you just like it. Like I like this. I like talking to you and recording the podcast. And I like hearing that people are getting something from the podcast. If they say, Hey, I listened to your podcast and I got something out of it. Like that brings me joy. And so that's why I do it, even though it's kind of work, you know? So I think people have to understand that work can be joyful and work can bring happiness. It, it's the way you think about it and the things that you do, like you said, being passionate yep. about it. So, so that I have that, um, people pleasing, um, was a big mistake. That's a huge mistake, right? <laughs> That's a whole nother <laughs> podcast, probably. <laughs> yeah, and some personalities are worse than others. I yes. learned from Myers Briggs that my personality, which is ENFJ, we're huge people pleasers, mm -hmm. and it's like to me, it doesn't like it doesn't seem bad. Like I don't mind if other people are happy, and it's funny to realize that because you know, it's interesting. Yeah, again, right. that's that, that recognizing what you're doing and why you're doing it. Are you just trying to make everybody happy and make everybody like you? Do you, do you need to be liked? Right, yeah. Is that part of, of it can be. what's yeah. going on? I'm not going to deny it might be. <laughs> oh, and I wasn't really aiming that at you, but in general. <laughs> it's okay, I can I think, handle it. I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people do need to be liked and so um if clients are being mean or or angry or whatever it hurts them on a personal level um not not just a, a business level and so that's part of the problem that we see um as well with the profession um taking things personally because you want to people please and and make everyone happy and can't we all just get along and except you like if you yeah. don't make you happy then that's a problem right. and then, then does any of it matter <laughs> if you make um, everyone else happy but yourself where are you at <laughs> right yeah and the, and sometimes we we go there like we we over people please and i yeah. heard someone tell me once people pleasing was lying and I thought that was really interesting because I never thought of it as lying, but sometimes you do like someone invites you somewhere and you really don't want to go and mm -hmm. you say, okay, just because you want to make them happy. So when I think about it as, do I really want, is this really going to be fun? Do I really want to do this? Cause I'm kind of a joiner that helps me not yeah. people please. Yeah. And do it because yep. I want to do it. Not because someone else wants me to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think the only other thing that I had down and it really kind of fits with stuff that we've already talked about in the toxic people is, is, um, tolerating gossip um, in the practice. Ugh. That's so hard <laughs> and, because we like the gossip, it. right? Yeah. We like yeah. it. It's fun. Yeah. On some like level it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On some level it is when someone else can be, um, 
in more pain than we are, you know, when <laughs> someone else is the, the brunt of what's going on. Um, and it's not us. As long as it's not us, it's okay. Yeah, um, but, but it is. But it's, it's really it's not. Really, it's so bad. Yeah, it's so bad. And I think when I think of a toxic practice, that's what I think of the most yeah. is gossip. And, I, and I've been through that in my practice where it got really, really bad. Um, and there's even like been teams, you know, like this team against that team. And oh, that, that's when it gets yeah. really bad. So yeah, you have yeah. to be and so you have to be so hard on that. You really do, and and define it, define it right out of the gate. Um, what is tolerated and what is not tolerated, and and then the hard part is accountability and really have being able to stand up and say, I'm really uncomfortable with what you just said. I feel like that could be interpreted as gossip. Um, let's change the subject or I, I I'd rather that we you not talk like that um, unless that person's in the room <laughs> right right yeah and I think be also being aware that that can happen behind your back like we talked about before if you're the leader like yeah. sometimes you don't know all the gossips going on because they won't do yeah. it in front of you and yeah. that's when it gets really sticky because it's a he said she said and yeah. you know I'm a big believer in bringing everyone into the room and then having it out but sometimes that's hard. It's a hard place to be in. Yeah. yeah. But gossip, it's bad. Yeah. It's a practice killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes when we're on social media and we're reading all that stuff, it's kind of like gossip. It is. That's what I think of when we I don't know it. the whole story. We're not, we're not party to it and we want to be supportive. That's where it all comes from, but it, it can really become really toxic. Yeah, I think a big mistake, and this might be a really good one to, to finish up on, is jumping into that social media stuff. Like so many times I read a post and I want to, because I disagree. I like, I start to type and then I'm like, nope, not my business, not my business. Mm -hmm. This isn't, you know, this isn't constructive unless, unless it's somebody's having a hard day and I just say, hey, I'm here for you. I love you or whatever. If I can't be supportive and kind, then I don't want to, I don't want to partake. And yeah. I think if everybody did that, if they thought first, my husband and I call it the 24 hour rule. Like mm -hmm. when any, anything big happens in my practice and I have to make a decision, I'm kind of like, all right, I need 24 hours because that gets rid of that high D, high I, like everything's going to fly out of my mouth before I think kind of thing that I do and just allow me to think it through. And I'm always make better decisions if I give myself 24 hours. Yeah. And so if you can do that on social media, don't comment until you've thought about it for 24 hours. I think the whole world would be a better place. <laughs> I think so too. I, I, enjoy many aspects of social media and I think it can be a great thing it's sure. such a wonderful way to connect with people but when it turns into nothing but complaining and gossiping I, I think it's harmful yeah and I think it's harmful to our I think it's harmful to our brains you know I'm always coaching people on their brains if I spend too much time reading social media I get really down and and yeah. just like hopeless because everything on there is so hopeless you yeah. know all you read is all this bad stuff so I would rather you you know call up a friend and talk to them or go outside and just get some yeah. sun you know <laughs> yeah my husband is not on social media at all a couple of years ago three years ago I think now he decided that all it did was make him angry after he was on it he was either sad or he was angry and he said Am I really getting benefit if that's the way I feel every time I, I'm yeah, on here? All, right. So so he left yeah. it and good for him, but I know it's hard for people to to disconnect from it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it, it's and it is kind of addicting. Like mm -hmm. sometimes I'll start to read and then I'll and time just goes because yeah. I'll read this post and then it turns into this comment and like you want to hear yeah. the end of the story and then you're like oh I just been sitting here for 30 minutes wasting my time so yeah. I, I really encourage people to put those phones somewhere else for a while don't look at them turn them off you know get schedule of that some time away from it because it really is it instead does of timer 
if you know you're gonna gonna go on there, fine. I, I'm not preaching to anybody to never go on social media because I do it. I do yeah. it on a daily yeah. basis. I mean, everybody likes it. It's kind of fun. But uh, yeah, you know, find some way that you don't, especially we're all short on time. We all have a million things we want or need to do. Um, and all of a sudden that time is gone without even realizing it. So, you know, find a way um, to, to have some control, take some control back over yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, have, and- I have my timer set on my phone to play the Rocky theme because everyone knows I love Rocky. And so when that, when dun, dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun, da, 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 starts playing, I know it's like, all right, get, it's time. <laughs> get moving, do something else, you know, oh, you, good. you've been on here 15 minutes, get off. Yeah. Awesome. It's a great thing to do. Yeah. Well, I, don't I enjoyed I our have, talk. Yeah. I don't think I have any other big mistakes, but I'm sure we could think of more if we, if we decide to, but I'm sure I, I love having you on the podcast. I always admire your wisdom and your positive attitude and you're a great individual. So uh-huh. I'm so well, happy you came you. on and I hope you'll come on again. If we have another topic that we want to talk about. Absolutely. Anytime. Like I said, this is one of my passions. Um, if oh. I can, share something that I've learned and, and maybe help someone else. I think it's a good thing. And it helps me from having to talk into this microphone by myself. Cause you know, I'm an extrovert and I, when I'm doing these by myself, it's not always fun. <laughs> I just pretend like all these people are, li- and I know they are, they're out there listening. So that's what sure. I have to picture is all these people out there listening. So if you're out there listening to this podcast and you liked it, Let us know, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, or if you need help or you're struggling, reach out to me for coaching, email us. My email is jacapeldvm at gmail.com. And I know if you want to talk to Sue, she'd be happy to email with you as well. And um, do you want to tell them your email address? Sure. My email address is Brooklyn Road Vet. So B-R-O-O-K-L-Y-N-R-D. V E T at hotmail.com. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you want to ask Sue a question and you forget that, just ask me and I'll get to her and we're in contact and hopefully we'll get to see each other in person. I feel like I haven't seen, I will be attending a a conference this fall. So I'm hoping you're going to the December conference. Awesome. I'm going to try, I might be in Florida. I'm, we're trying to figure that out right now, but if I'm not, I'll be there. I definitely I'm happy to get back to in person. Yes. I, I'm yeah. looking forward to, to seeing people again. This is All great, right. but it's not the same. No, I, I'm enjoying it, but it's still not the same. Yeah. In person's way better. Well, thank you so much. All I right. appreciate you being here and um, I'll talk to you soon. Bye Sounds everybody. Great. Thanks, Julie. Bye soon.